Why the U.S. Navy permanently banned the F-22 Raptor. The F-22 Raptor. For over two decades, it's been the most dominant fighter jet on the planet. It's an apex predator of the skies, built for one reason, to be absolutely untouchable. It has stealth that makes it a ghost to radar. It can outrun enemies without even trying, and its agility seems to defy physics. By any measure, it's the king of modern air combat. The U.S. Air Force built its entire strategy of air superiority around this incredible machine. And yet, the world's most powerful navy, with its globe-spanning fleet of supercarriers, wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. The F-22 Raptor was effectively rejected for duty on any U.S. aircraft carrier. This wasn't just a case of inter-service rivalry, or the navy simply saying, no thanks, we'll build our own. The story of why the F-22 was never adopted by the Navy is a far more complex and fascinating saga. It's a tale of brutal physics, eye-watering costs, and a fundamental clash of ideas about what a fighter jet should even be. This is the story of the technical and strategic battle that kept the world's most advanced jet off its warships forever. Hook! The F-22 Raptor was engineered to be the most dominant fighter jet in the world, untouchable in the skies. So why did the U.S. Navy declare it completely unfit for sea duty? The answer isn't simple politics. It's a story of brutal physics, staggering costs, and a strategic battle that kept this incredible jet off its warships. A Cold War dream of absolute dominance. To understand why the F-22 never went to sea, we have to rewind to the final, tense years of the Cold War. In the early 1980s, the U.S. was in a high-stakes tech race with the Soviet Union. Intelligence was pouring in about new Soviet fighters on the horizon, the Su-27 Flanker and the MiG-29 Fulcrum. These were big, powerful, and incredibly maneuverable aircraft. America's workhorses, the F-15 Eagle and F-16 Fighting Falcon, were still the best, but the gap was closing fast. The U.S. Air Force knew it couldn't just build a better fighter. It needed a generational leap. It needed a machine so advanced it could guarantee dominance for decades. So, in 1981, the Advanced Tactical Fighter, or ATF program, was born. The goal was audacious, to create a fighter that blended four revolutionary capabilities. Stealth, to be invisible to enemy radar. Supercruise, the ability to fly supersonic without guzzling fuel on afterburners. Extreme maneuverability for any dogfight and integrated avionics to give the pilot godlike situational awareness. This was a wish list that bordered on sci-fi. Two teams were chosen to make it a reality. Northrop and McDonnell Douglas created the sleek, exotic YF-23. Lockheed, Boeing, and General Dynamics countered with the YF-22. After a tense fly-off, the Air Force chose the YF-22 in 1991. The aircraft that became the F-22 Raptor was a marvel. Its shape was meticulously designed to scatter radar waves, making its radar cross-section famously compared to that of a steel marble. Its two Pratt & Whitney F-119 engines were masterpieces, allowing it to supercruise at over Mach 1.5. And visually, these engines had two-dimensional thrust vectoring nozzles, paddles that could direct the engine's exhaust up and down giving the Raptor otherworldly agility. The F-22 wasn't just a step forward, it was a jump into the future, an aircraft built from the ground up to rule the skies from land bases. But another branch of the military had a very different domain to rule, the open ocean. The Navy's parallel universe and the dream of a sea Raptor. While the Air Force was obsessed with its ATF program, the Navy had its own problems. Its top-tier fighter was the legendary F-14 Tomcat. An icon of the Cold War, the F-14 was designed to do one thing better than anyone else. Protect the carrier battle group from swarms of Soviet bombers armed with anti-ship missiles. But by the late 1980s, the Tomcat was getting old and expensive to maintain. The Navy needed a replacement. This led to the Naval Advanced Tactical Fighter, or NATF, program. In an era of shrinking defense budgets, developing two separate stealth fighters seemed insane. So, a seemingly brilliant idea was born. Synergy. The plan was simple on paper. Whichever design won the Air Force's competition would be adapted for the Navy. 
When the YF-22 won, the path seemed clear. Lockheed Martin was asked to explore a navalized variant, a carrier-capable Raptor, unofficially known as the NATF-22. The dream was tantalizing. Imagine the world's most dominant fighter jet operating from America's supercarriers. A stealthy, supercruising guardian that could project power anywhere on Earth. But as engineers began to seriously study what it would take to put a Raptor on a carrier, this beautiful dream quickly collided with a wall of harsh reality. They were about to discover that the very things that made the F-22 a perfect land-based fighter made it fundamentally wrong for a life at sea. The unsolvable problem, a battle against brutal physics. An aircraft carrier deck is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. It's three acres of sovereign moving territory where aircraft aren't so much flown as they are manhandled. The rules of a 10,000-foot concrete runway are thrown out, replaced by the brutal mechanics of the catapult and arresting gear. And it was here that the F-22's design superiority became its biggest liability. The first glaring problem was weight. A land-based F-22 has an empty weight of around 43,000 pounds. A purpose-built carrier fighter, like the F-A-18EF Super Hornet, weighs just over 32,000 pounds. That 11,000-pound difference is monumental. It's the weight of two rhinos. Now, imagine trying to land that extra weight on a short, moving, pitching runway. This leads to the core issue, the controlled crash of a carrier landing. A Navy pilot doesn't gently touch down. They fly at a steep angle of attack and a high descent rate straight into the deck, aiming to have a tailhook snag one of four steel cables. This brings the jet from about 150 miles per hour to a dead stop in just two seconds. The forces are incredible. The aircraft's structure, especially its landing gear, has to be massively over-engineered to withstand this repeated punishment. The F-22's landing gear, while tough, was designed for smooth runways. Faced with a carrier arrestment, the Raptor's gear would have likely sheared off, collapsing under the stress. This would not only destroy a hugely expensive aircraft, but could also damage the carrier's deck and threaten the entire crew. But landing was only half the problem. Getting off the deck means being shot off by a catapult, which accelerates an aircraft from zero to over 160 miles per hour in about two seconds. To withstand this, a carrier jet's nose gear and forward fuselage must be heavily reinforced to handle being literally thrown off the ship. The F-22's airframe, optimized for stealth and aerodynamics, just wasn't built for that kind of abuse. Then there's the environment itself. Salt spray is relentlessly corrosive. Carrier aircraft are designed with this in mind. The F-22, however, is famous for its delicate and high-maintenance stealth skin. Exposing it to the harsh, salty, 24-7 environment of a carrier deck would have been a maintenance nightmare, costing a fortune and compromising the F-22's single greatest advantage. The Navy realized a standard F-22 wasn't just impractical for carrier use, it was impossible. The ghost of the Tomcat and the compromised Raptor. Faced with these problems, engineers knew that just adding a tailhook to an F-22 wouldn't work. To create a carrier-borne Raptor, they'd have to fundamentally re-engineer it. This led to the proposal for the NATF-22, and it's here the story gets interesting. To create the future, they had to look to the past, to the F-14 Tomcat it was meant to replace. The biggest challenge for a carrier jet is balancing high-speed performance with stable, low-speed handling for landings. The F-22's fixed wings were perfect for a high-altitude dogfight, but terrible for a slow approach to a pitching deck. The F-14 Tomcat solved this with its iconic variable sweep wings, which could sweep forward for low-speed lift and back for supersonic speed. Engineers on the NATF-22 concept came to a stark conclusion. To make the new fighter work, they had to give it the same kind of wings. The proposed NATF-22 featured variable sweep wings. This decision, however, created a cascade of deal-breaking compromises. First, the swing wing mechanism is incredibly heavy, adding thousands of pounds to an already too heavy aircraft. Second, and most critically, it would have ruined the F-22's stealth. The Raptor's shape is a work of art, with every edge angled to deflect radar. A moving wing with large seams and gaps would light up an enemy radar screen like a Christmas tree. 
the NATF-22 would have been a stealth fighter that wasn't very stealthy. Third, the complexity and cost would skyrocket. The F-14's swing wings were a maintenance nightmare. A similar system on the NATF-22 would have been even more expensive and difficult to maintain. The aircraft would be heavier, less stealthy, more complex, and more expensive. In trying to navalize the F-22, they were creating a compromised hybrid. It was no longer a true Raptor, but a bloated shadow of its land-based sibling. If you're finding this deep dive into military engineering and strategy compelling, and you want more stories behind the world's most advanced technology, take a moment to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Your support lets us keep digging into these topics. The Billion Dollar Question and the End of the Cold War While engineers wrestled with physics, a more powerful force was reshaping the world, politics, and money. The justification for the F-22 and NATF programs was the Soviet threat. But in 1991, the same year the YF-22 was selected, the Soviet Union officially dissolved. The Cold War was over. Suddenly, the world changed. In Washington, a new phrase entered the vocabulary, the peace dividend. The public and politicians demanded that huge defense sums be redirected to other priorities. The pressure to cut the military budget was immense. In this new climate, every expensive military program was scrutinized, and none was more expensive than the F-22. The Air Force program was already criticized for its staggering price tag. Now consider the NATF-22. This wasn't just a modified F-22, it was a significantly different aircraft needing its own design, research, and tooling. The swing wing, reinforced landing gear, and strengthened airframe meant the NATF-22 would be substantially more expensive than its already costly Air Force cousin. The Navy, facing its own budget cuts, did the math. They were being asked to pour billions into a risky program for a compromised fighter, all to replace an F-14, that seemed less urgent in a post-Soviet world. The cost just didn't make sense. Key Navy figures began to publicly question the program's affordability. In 1991, the NATF program was quietly canceled. The Navy officially walked away from the F-22. The financial reality of the post-Cold War era had killed a dream that was already mortally wounded by technical challenges. The Sea Raptor was a price the nation was no longer willing or able to pay. The final nail in the coffin for a naval F-22 wasn't technical or financial, it was strategic. The very nature of naval aviation was changing. The fall of the Soviet Union didn't just affect budgets, it changed the Navy's mission. The F-14, and by extension, the F-22, were products of a Cold War mindset. They were pure air superiority fighters or fleet interceptors. Their main job was to sweep the skies of high-end enemy jets. But in the conflicts of the 90s and 2000s, the primary threat wasn't a sophisticated air force. The Navy needed to attack ground targets, support troops, and conduct reconnaissance. This new reality demanded a different kind of aircraft, a multi-role workhorse. The Navy needed a jack-of-all-trades, not a master of one. This is where the F-A-18 Hornet and its successor, the Super Hornet, excelled. The F-A stands for Fighter Attack. It could dogfight one moment and drop bombs the next. It was versatile, reliable, and already built for carrier life. While the Super Hornet filled the gap, the Navy also looked to the future, becoming a key partner in the Joint Strike Fighter program. This program would ultimately produce the F-35 Lightning II. Crucially, the F-35 was designed from day one with three variants. The F-35A for the Air Force, the F-35B for the Marines, and the F-35C for the Navy. The F-35C was engineered from its very conception for carrier operations. It has a larger wing area for better low-speed control, a stronger airframe, and a robust landing gear and tailhook system built for the violence of carrier landings. While it can't match the F-22's raw performance in a pure dogfight, it offers something the Raptor never could, a stealthy multi-role platform that was purpose-built for the sea. The Navy's pivot to flexibility, embodied by the Super Hornet and now the F-35C, sealed the F-22's fate. A landlocked king. 
So why was the world's greatest fighter jet never adopted by the U.S. Navy? The answer is a convergence of unassailable facts. First, the brutal physics of carrier operations were fundamentally incompatible with the F-22's design. It was too heavy, its landing gear too fragile, and its airframe too delicate for the controlled chaos of carrier operations. Second, the proposed solution, the navalized NATF-22 concept, was a study in devastating compromises. Adding swing wings would have sacrificed the very stealth and performance that defined the Raptor, all while making it heavier and more complex. Third, the staggering cost of this compromised jet became impossible in the post-Cold War era of budget cuts. And finally, the U.S. Navy's entire strategy shifted. It no longer needed a specialized air-to-air -air fighter. The future of naval aviation lay with versatile, multi-role platforms like the F-A-18 and the F-35C, aircraft designed from the ground up for a life at sea. The F-22 Raptor wasn't rejected because it wasn't good enough. It was, and arguably still is, the best at what it does. It was rejected because it was a specialist of the highest order, perfected for a single domain, the sky above the land. Its absence from the fleet isn't an indictment of its power, but a testament to its very specific and terrestrial perfection. The F-22 remains the undisputed king of the sky, a landlocked legend whose shadow will never fall upon an aircraft carrier's deck. What do you think? Would a carrier-based Raptor have changed naval history, or was the Navy right to pursue a different path? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this story, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more deep dives into the technology that shapes our world. Thanks for watching.